How many people is it you killed again? Two. Two? Two. You were sent to prison when you were 20 for murder. Mm -hmm. You served time in one of the most dangerous prisons in the country. And then you killed someone else. Yes, ma'am. Why did they let you out on parole? Because I've been a positive force for many years. Dominic Henry, or Chip for short, was convicted of multiple murders in the 1980s and sentenced to life plus 40 years. But in 2016, against all odds, he was granted parole. Shortly after his release, the Federal Bureau of Prisons, or BOP, hired Chip to run an experimental re-entry program. This never been done before and gave our cameras unprecedented access. You were the first video camera that came into an institution in my career. If you didn't create that program you created, and you wouldn't give that chance, I probably wouldn't be alive, man. When we began this journey six years ago, we had no idea where it would lead. The program succeeded and then suddenly collapsed. Who told you not to talk to us? The education supervisor called me a con man all our access had been revoked. And we ultimately learned secrets about America's federal prison system, which they never wanted to become public. Do you recall having a personal relationship? Is it so hard for you to believe that they were so afraid of you exposing stuff? Congress is giving us another chance. We don't have the option to fail. The stakes are pretty high here. If you put a step wrong, you could be back in prison. The Federal Bureau of Prisons, or BOP, is America's largest prison system. They hold roughly 159,000 men and women. Half of federal prisoners will re-offend and return to prison after they've been released. After 35 years locked away, Chip returned to prison a year after his release. This time, he's here to train prison leaders to run his rehabilitation program, Young Men Incorporated, or YMI. The essence of the program is prisoners helping prisoners. The expectation is y'all get the resources on the compound with staff and the prisoners, and then y'all set the goals and objectives. Chip is leading this introductory class for the facilitators. So these are guys who have influential roles in gangs and different groups and different communities. He's got them on board in order to lead this program over the next few months. Every prison offers educational classes, but the people who need them the most are least likely to enroll. YMI leverages the respect earned by gang leaders. When people hear gangs, they automatically assume the negative thing. But you know, but the gang members are the guys that broke the peace for the whole combat. The men in this room have long sentences for crimes ranging from armed robbery and murder to running some of America's largest drug trafficking organizations. These leaders help reach younger prisoners with an ingrained criminal mindset. The goal is to teach the skills needed to prevent them from cycling in and out of prison. Why would you want a gang leader in your program, it's going to spoil the program. And my response is, the church is for the sinners. And there's something about the youngsters. Them guys want to be led. And when they see men standing up right, leading something, all of them come at the table. Had I been able to be exposed to a group of men that were all about helping me and empowering me, who had my respect already, it would have made a difference. There's never been anything like this. I honor and appreciate you coming in here to give back to us. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you much. <laughs> My first impression of Dominic Henry, he was a con man. Tracy Longacre started as an education specialist with the BOP over 20 years ago. At first, I was very apprehensive about it. Some staff thought that all they're doing is they're trying to recruit the younger inmates in into their their gang life, and he was not a good inmate. And when they said that he had killed other people in the prison, I was a little leery of him. 
Originally convicted for murder in the 1980s, Chip was considered a terror inside. He escaped from one prison, and after being sent to the United States Penitentiary Marion, a supermax prison where the federal government held its most dangerous felons, he stomped a rival to death. I met Dominique Henry. He's just coming out of Marion in the control unit. You know, when you hear that, you know he's been doing bad things throughout the system. He's the real deal. Yeah, he's the real deal. But also, he always knew how to connect with the different races. You know, back when we had came in the system, racism was real strong, especially with the Ernie Brotherhood and the DC Blacks. When things would happen or were about to happen, they wouldn't talk to anybody else but Chip. Over time, Chip began to see how his reputation and knack for crossing racial lines could be a tool not only for peace, but for rehabilitation. How do you change your mind like that, going from having multiple murder cases on you to wanting to begin a program in order to try and help other inmates. Can you tell me how that got started? When you see people go out and come back, it does something to you. I'm seeing guys, you know, coming back to prison, kill somebody, got killed, went home, got killed, killed somebody. We never learn how to bridge that gap between ourselves and our community. There was no other program that could accomplish that. If it's ran right, it would be three times more effective than anything else. When I first found out that Dominic Henry was bringing in the YMI program and that Vice would be coming in with the camera to Cumberland, I was in shock and disbelief. The policy was cameras did not come in, period. But our cameras did get in. That's thanks to Judy Simon Garrett, the acting deputy director of the BOP. Judy believed in Chip and the potential of his program. She hired him and directed Cumberland to run YMI and grant us access to film inside the prison. Judy brought the program in because of her position. She wanted it to happen, she made it happen. And at that level, she's the one calling the shots. The rest of the staff, they were not on board for this. If an older inmate is working with the younger inmates, they oftentimes think it's for nefarious reasons. Why are we giving them this special treatment? but there was a lot of positive response from the MA population at Cumberland. As the YMI program progressed, Talib Shakir, who was convicted for second-degree murder, began leading their re-entry efforts from inside. Crime is a result, right, of what? Lack of education, poor choices, poverty. In order to stop crime, you have to, what, build a community. That's how you fix the problem. This is what makes this program beneficial because you're learning the educational skills that you need to go out and fix the actual problem of crime. A lot of people can relate to me and my story, my background, and my history. So I think that's been an inspiration to a lot of the younger guys. When you have that credibility, that you're a man of your word, that you have this integrity, that you haven't violated these offenses, then people look at you with respect. So you abide by the prison code and therefore a lot of people respect you? 25 years in prison in itself uh, weighs, has a lot of weight with it. Mm-hmm. You've done 25 years in prison? Yeah, 25 years. How old were you when you got in here? 17. Uh, August this year I'm going up for parole. It'll be the third time I'm going up for parole. I'm looking forward to that. What happened the last time you went up for parole? Uh, they didn't think that I was, uh, had served enough time on the sentence. So that's what happened. Hopefully this program actually helps me. Talib is preparing himself and younger inmates to one day re-enter society. But some of the facilitators, like Kevin Jones Bay, are participating without any hope of ever walking free. How long have you been inside for? 7,403 days. I've been in the same cell since 1999. How did you end up here? I was convicted of drug trafficking. And what's your sentence? Life without parole. What makes you the right person to be facilitating this course? I mean, people will be watching this, they'll say, you've performed some terrible crimes, otherwise you wouldn't be sentenced with such a harsh sentence. Yeah, you know, argumentum ad hominem. You know, a logical fallacy so old that it's been given a name. Because I am from where I'm from, because I've been through what I've been through, then I am uniquely qualified to be the one to help, you see. It would be very difficult for you to get through to some of these young guys. 
I can get through to them because I am them. They trust me. A lot of the guys, they're getting involved in the program or they're facilitating the program because they have a feeling that it might help with their sentence. For you, that might not be the case. Right. You might not ever get out of here. Right. What will it mean to you to see this program succeed? I'm ashamed of my past behavior. It's not a reflection of my family and my upbringing. And I'm determined that it isn't going to be the legacy that I leave for generations to come, okay? I would rather all memory of Kevin Jones be cast into the abyss of oblivion than be remembered as a drug dealer. This is my opportunity to ensure that. I know the hopeless and despair on that compound. I know what that is. I know how that paralyzes us. It paralyzed me. That journey that I had 35 years, this is what this is all about because just think about it, man. This never been done before. I'm gonna take this energy and build this so this compound can be, as you say, liberal. What was it like when you first got out and you saw the world? Like, you know how you go to a movie, you see a, when Star Wars first came out, mm -hmm. and you go see Star Wars the first time, and it's like, it's just, it's just so amazing, you know? You see people, everybody with cell phones, and just, one thing that stands out, when I left the street, the young women, they was pretty much young women. The young women today, they are so aggressive. I mean, they fight more than we do. That's what you noticed? <laughs> yeah. Feminism happened. Women's rights happened. You missed it. Right here. What happened here? The first murder case I got. This is where you killed someone? Yeah, right here. And what happened right here? Nika's mother, she used to like to walk down here because this was a, a, a pretty decent neighborhood. So what happened when she came back to me, she's, she said, man, let me see your gun. And then my mind started racing. And then I just started examining, examining her clothes. So someone assaulted your girlfriend at the time? I go find them immediately. And I stopped. He looked at me. Exact words were, that bitch. And he said that. I just lost it. Went back to my car, got my gun. Uh, and pretty much the biggest mistake of my life. It's been one whole year of planning and recruiting. Back in Cumberland Prison, CHIP's YMI program is now in full swing. We're about making community leaders, okay? So each one of you will return to your community as a leader. We had 150 people show up for the first day. The officers, they thought it was a riot. So how does the program work? First, new recruits are assessed to determine their learning style. Next, they're paired with a mentor. My short-term goals is try to successfully get my GED. How many kids you have? I have more. Members who have not completed their high school education are enrolled in a GED program so they can obtain their degree as they progress. The recruits are then sorted into groups. A vocational group utilizes the trade skill classes provided by the prisons. Entrepreneurs take classes from fellow prisoners with real world experiences in fields like accounting, real estate and finance. Hedge funds, mutual funds, insurance companies, IRAs, these are called traditional investors. What this is all about now is how to fill out this element called a resume. This is all about transformation. When I leave here, I have something to bring to society. It's just like what the Joker said in Batman, way they get a load of me. <laughs> YMI's recruits have lived a life of crime for a long time. 
As they train for the job market, the cognitive group are also required to take classes that force them to reckon with how their actions affect others. All of our rules and regulations have been dependent upon anti-social behavior, what we call street justice. Most of our associates and friends in the past have always been from that world. How do we let that go? In order to get anywhere with this program, you have to first understand what empathy is. That's the first and foremost. You have a single cell. The bus come in and they move a homosexual in your cell. We don't discriminate, right? And we empathize with people as facilitators. How do we deal with that, man? Well, I can empathize with anyone. If a person's a homosexual, a rat, or a snitch, um, a pedophile, or anything like hey, that, hold on I feel for a like second, because I don't want you lumping homosexuality in with criminal activity, right? That's the first thing, okay? Every person has the right to representation, period. These are serious issues, and that's why the chairman brought it up. I had a situation myself. A guy came in, and they put him on the top bunk, and he was, you know, he was gay. And I didn't have a problem with it. And yet, some guys who I know, some younger guys, they hurt him bad. And they thought that they were doing what I wanted them to do. You got to challenge yourself. You got to challenge those ideas of how do we see somebody in terms of his sexuality or, or his past behavior. You got to challenge your morals and your principles. That's the crux of this program. Always step out of our own shoes and put on somebody else's, right? And then we may see, okay, you know what? It's not as easy as I thought it would be. But if you're not going to be real with yourself to ask yourself these hard questions, how can you affect change? The key to keeping the YMI program running is to have a regenerative structure where members are promoted as others are released. So they're preparing to hold a debate to elect the next generation of leaders. The debate is our formal way of bringing in our next YMI presidents and YMI vice presidents. They're going to take over our position soon. Mr. G. Williams, Mr. D. Williams, no relation. We followed the presidential candidates as they met with their mentors ahead of the debate. Uh, you don't have no kids, do you? So you don't understand, man, just not being out there with them. It's hard when, when your daughters ask you, man, Daddy, is you coming home today? Or, or can we stay here with you? But they don't understand. It, it, it really hurts me, man, when I got to explain to them, Daddy made a mistake. I would just ask you to be aware of this word. I made a mistake. Mistake, you, know, you don't dot your eye, you don't cross your T. It's a, it's a mistake. But as long as you keep seeing your actions or your behaviors as a mistake, who's to say you won't make it again and again and again? You got to understand in life you make choices. I had to learn at a young age that my situation is the way that it is because of choices that I've made. And when you can understand the power of having a choice, you can take ownership of your life. You're talking about leading where I'm at. You're talking about leading a family. You're talking about leaving a legacy behind. And you having children, you gotta understand that, man. Is this the legacy you wanna leave behind? After you. So this is something that you wrote for me, right? Yeah. And it's um, very emotional. I want you to tear it up, and I want you to let go of the baggage. The guys in the program, they respect you, but you're not approachable. You have a wall around you. You know what the facilitators said about this debate that's coming up? Everyone felt that you would make the best president for YMI, but everyone felt that you would lose the election. <laughs> it's because of the things that are in that letter. You're carrying around a heavy burden. In order for you to be what you're capable of becoming, you have to be willing to allow yourself to be vulnerable. So this is a, just a symbolic act, right? You're tearing that up. You've taken your lesson wait, wait. from it. Could you read it, or could you read parts of it? I understand.
I can choose to look at myself as a victim or view myself as a survivor. Learning your father was murdered at the age of six by the same people who you thought were the good guys, the police. To research the facts to 20 years later and learn that his death was ruled a justified homicide. By the time I was 12, I was granted the opportunity to put a gun to the face of an attacker. I was then a smoker, a drinker, a dope boy. I was like, what did I have to lose? Now I sit making sense from my mistakes, trials, and tribulations. I'll be damned if I don't make this shit work for my children. I want my legacy to be plentiful and my reputation to be empowering and my life to be inf influential. It took a bit for me to try to grasp in my mind how good could an inmate teacher be in a class. As it started to progress more and more, I could see that there was merit in the program. The guys that went through the program, they, they get a different attitude. And they start seeing it is possible for them to be a gang leader and to also have finally found empathy. Dominic Henry was for real. His heart and soul were in the program. Staff that were able to see the program you were able to change their minds and they started to see the benefit of it. Mr. Henry's vision already has a blueprint set up for us. It is the day of the presidential election for this program. Gregory here is busy prepping for it. This is a huge deal, not just for these two candidates, but also for the future of the program. I can tell that Gregory is a little nervous. Thank you. Give a round of applause for Mr. D. Williams. And a round of applause for Mr. G. Williams. What can you convey to the inmates who believe YMI is just another con game? And to the current and potential supporters who will pledge their time and resources to Young Men Incorporated? First of all, YMI is not a game. Matter of fact, one of our objectives is to deglamorize the game. My job as your president is to help you out as much as possible. You know me, relaxed, cool, collected. And unlike my opponent, I'm approachable. 2007, 2008, out of those who graduated, 100% of the people never came back to jail. You still think it's a game? With me being the president, I promise you, man, make y'all proud. Okay, 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 unapproachable. <laughs> okay, can I hear hum man? Con game. Who's being conned? Why am I? Receives no incentive. You know, I can go and get my GED, $25. I can take a drug abuse program, get $30. This Why Am I program, it's all from you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is prime time proof. Check it out, life plus 40. If he can do it, why can't we? He's walked our same walk. He has worn this very uniform. We got to put in that necessary work, man, so we can get to where we need to be to see this world as a better place. Who did you vote for? Uh, I mean, we'll find out in a minute. D Williams got 29 votes. D Williams got 25 votes. D Williams by four. I would really hope that you would join me as my vice president. do it without you. 
I love him to death, but I'm glad he lost. The reason why I'm saying I'm glad he lost is because from this situation, the predicament that we're in, being incarcerated, most people think that we've lost. But it's from right here that people achieve that, that aha moment and they become great from right here. They leave this situation and they become great fathers, they become leaders, they become entrepreneurs. Man, I gotta take this, this, this. I gotta take the loser road home now. I gotta take this journey. You gonna be the vice president? You still gonna have a voice, man. I take this journey now. Man. You'll be all right. You know, journey. What journey you take? Where you going? You gonna cry? I might. I might. I might go. Man, share me a tear or something. I can't share it in front of the front of the men. Why not? You. You. That's a. That's a man thing. No, it's not. That's a perception, man. Crying is a relief. Point blank. I've been in prison 26 years. You know, I get to the 17 year mark, see the parole board, I do all the right thing. When they gave me that piece of paper that said I had to do five more years, right? What did you think I did? You think I turned my head? I didn't give a damn who saw me crying because that was five more years of my life that I was going to waste in prison. And I went to my men and I cried and they understood me. Because had I not had those people around to, 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 to let that emotion out with, right, ain't no telling what I would've done. That don't make you less of a man. What make you less of a man is when you don't address those emotions and you go out on the compound and do something stupid. When my father died, this last, on his dying bed, I'm on a, a fucking prison phone. On a prison phone crying in front of a bunch of men. You think I can? This is the most important person in my life, dying. So man, don't never man feel like you that this is some uh, soft shit or this shit make you less than a man. If you feel that emotion, man, let that shit go. That, uh, that other shit, this jailhouse shit, this image, this uh, persona, of this would it take to be, man, this shit don't count for nothing in the world, man. You can't teach your kids this. Don't, I hate, I hate, I hate to hear that. I've been in prison long enough, I've been alive in the world. You think I give a fuck about who see me crying, who don't see me crying? Real talk, huh? don't ever do that. Don't ever do that. Don't ever do that. Never. After being denied parole twice and serving over 25 years in prison, Talib was once again eligible for parole. We obtained the Parole Commission's recording of his latest hearing. You appear to the Superior Court of Sentencing on May 1st, 1995. How old were you at that time? In 2013, the Commission found that you practiced increasing violence, uh, creating an unacceptable risk to the community that had not diminished over time. What's changed since that last determination? You know, somebody's life was. I can't tell them that you wasted that. No matter how good that is, I still, the only thing that I have to do is continue to be better, make the right choices, help the other people make the right choices. And we also have uh, Ms. Barr, she's the associate warden. I'm going to come in and speak to his involvement with the Unincorporated. The intent behind the program is to recruit the worst of the worst and change their frame of thinking to where now we've got them signing up for every class in the education department. If it weren't for his leadership of it, it would not be the success that it is. Two months later, we returned to see if Talib would be released. What it says. It says parole effective February 28, 2019, after the service of 303 months. So 
they've given me parole. Uh, I said I wasn't gonna do this. Uh, uh, oh man. Y'all want to see Williams cry. We all got to act like I was denied, all right? What's up, man? Let's see, man. They gave it to me, Slip. Mm, mm, they mm. gave it to me. They gave it to me, man. This shit is over. Yeah. Up, man. I'm happy. But at the same time, I, don't, I normally some good men by my family. But I really want you to, man, carry that banner. I want you to hold it together. I want you to keep this thing running. Why am I, you know, it's a platform that allows us to be human. And I think that's something that, you know, you don't get inside of prison. It's the end of something, but it's the beginning of something. I haven't met anyone who came into prison as young as you did, who only talks about the things that he is going to do for others. Like I told you from the beginning, you're younger than I am, right? But I will follow you anyway. And I mean that. Talib being granted parole was a rare glimmer of hope and an illustration of success for CHIP's YMI program itself. But just as momentum was growing, we heard news that surprised us. Chip had suddenly been barred from entering Cumberland Prison, and the program itself was falling apart. We're on our way to meet Talib, who is staying near here at a halfway house. He's just recently got out. We were supposed to actually film his release, and then we heard that all our access had been revoked, so we weren't allowed to film his release. We weren't allowed to go back into the prison to film anything about the progress of the program, but hoping to get some clarity with Talib. Good to see you, it's been a while. How are you doing? You all right? Welcome back yeah. out. All right, Talib, I'm gonna need you to direct me. <laughs> Do you know how this works? Yeah, I haven't done any driving yet, so um, probably not the best prison with the Russians. <laughs> so how long have you been out for now? This is the, this is the, this is the third week. It's weird because it, it just went from one day, your whole life is just preoccupied with being in prison, wanting your freedom, and then getting it the next day. And as soon as you get it, within an hour or so, it's like it never happened. Who told you not to talk to us? Staff. The prison staff? Prison staff. They pretty much knew that I would get the information that they didn't want us to have. Was the support for the program suddenly pulled? Yeah. Like overnight? Pretty much. One day Chip was here, the next day he wasn't. So it was obvious that it was something going on with him. Where they kind of took his contract from him. And so Chip is now not allowed into the prison? No, he couldn't come in. As when I left, he was officially done with. Do you know what's been going on? 
what's been going on? Well, allegedly, there's some sexual harassment uh, allegations against one of the uh, directors or acting director or something in central office that Dominic has filed against her. And who is she? I met her once, Judy. Well, it was Judy who got us inside the prison in the first place to film right. the program. She's the one that brought attention to the program. Right. She was the one that told us to come and film this. Right. In a strange turn of events, we learned that Chip had filed a complaint of discrimination. He alleged that acting deputy director Judy Simon Garrett, the very person who paved the way to bring Chip's program to federal prison, made romantic advances on him, then became hostile and threatened his work. Chip shared Judy's text messages with us. She speaks of the love she has for him, how her position at the BOP can help him, and eventually the anger she feels towards him. They also include a photo on stage with Attorney General Jack Sessions and a selfie of Judy laying in a bed. She said, listen, you frustrate me and confuse me and make me sad, but fact of the matter is, I really do love you. I've spent weeks trying to convince myself not to, but it isn't working. What was that about? When I used to greet her, I used to call her, sweetheart, how you doing? Well, I used to do that. But it wasn't in the realm of me trying to pursue a relationship. But if I really wanted that, that type of relationship, I could have had it. And we wouldn't even be talking about this. Did you sleep with her? At one point, she sent you a message saying, how do you just stop communicating with someone you supposedly love? This message implies that you told her you loved her. Yeah, I told her that. I love the fact that me being able to give back to my comrades. I love the fact of the things that I was allowed to do. But it wasn't love what she wanted. If I had a chance to do it all over again, I would probably do it a lot different. But I just came into the real world. And, you know, like things are moving kind of quick. I'm doing what I'm doing. I got these people helping me, this and that. Yes. Yes, I love that. Chip says he never had a sexual relationship with Judy. But things undeniably got weird. This is one of the, um, one of the spots she used to tell me to meet her at. I had to bring this because at the end of the day, I want people to understand. So she gave you this bottle? Yeah. With a note inside it? Yeah. I love you so very much. I love you for who you are, who you have been, and who you will be. I know your real life is just beginning, and I hope I have the privilege to be with you every step of the way as you make history. You are my one in a million. The second most powerful person in the BOP hand gave you this message in a bottle. Yeah. So we're trying to get hold of the woman herself, Judy Simon Garrett, to see what she has to say about actually addressing these claims of sexual harassment that Chip has filed. Hi, this is Isabel Young calling from Vice. How are you? Good, thanks. We were hoping to have a chat with you. Um, I mean, partly about the program, because obviously you're the one that brought us the program in the first place and made us aware of it. Um, and partly about uh, what's going on with Dominic Chip Henry. I have no idea what's going on with him at all. I haven't um, been involved with anything with the program in a very long time. Well, so obviously we weren't able to continue filming the program. And then... Dominic Chip Henry is, um, has made us aware of the sexual harassment allegations that he's filing. I don't never seen any allegations filed, so I, I couldn't speak to that, certainly. After Chip filed his formal complaint, Why Am I Unraveled? An investigation was launched into both Chip and Judy. The fragile support that kept Why Am I running was gone and the prison staff who didn't want to empower prisoners to begin with also pulled their support. It was very difficult for me to sit back and watch as an educator a program that was making a difference to just be ripped away. That's where you really saw the impact, where these guys were kind of lost. They had had a purpose, they had had a focus, they had a mission, and then it was just taken away from them. 
and they were just left with nothing. It was shut down and you just kept your mouth shut. Just let it go. It died a slow death. You never challenged Judy Garrett because she could make or break you. She could. Don't worry about ever talking to me again. After what I have shown you in terms of support, you want to accuse me of some shit. Yeah, let's see how things work out without my support. She says here, I can assure you, you won't be doing any business with me and the BOP. And that's, you know, uh, the retaliation. Judy declined any further requests for comment and rejected our reporting. There's always this idea that you are your crime. Regardless of how successful you become in life, you can never outrun being in prison, being incarcerated. For a black man to come forward with these allegations, there's always this doubt. Why would this white woman of this stature find this black guy of this stature to be worth anything? And for him to not capitalize on that, what is he up to? Good afternoon, Chairman Gowdy and members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the operation of the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Chip's complaint was not the only one being filed against BOP officials. Reports of sexual misconduct and cover-ups by BOP staff and leadership had got the attention of Congress. We're about to go into this hearing by the House Oversight Committee where they're set to address some of the allegations of widespread misconduct and mismanagement within the BOP, which suggests that some of the things that we've been uncovering could be much more systemic and a much bigger problem than we initially thought. When you come across an agency that is so problematic, such as BOP, what is the solution? It appears to me one of the problems in, in the Bureau of Prisons is it, a culture that's allowed some employees, a handful, to do whatever they wish. What percentage of employees that are investigated end up with some kind of uh, action taken by the department? Uh, many of those individual investigations don't result in any kind of uh, sustained findings. If you're found to commit sexual harassment of an employee, never mind an inmate, the outcome in the private sector is you're unemployed. This isn't a discussion. This isn't a, this isn't a, if we have findings of that, you run employed. Hi, Director Howitz, I'm Isabel Young from Vice Media. I just wanted to ask one question you about um, the program questions. that... Yeah, I'm not going to answer questions to the media right I'm now. I'm terribly sorry. Just about, like, the Young Men Incorporated program that we've been right, following I'm, with I'm Dominic Henry. We, I just wanted to ask wanted if that has anything to do with the sexual harassment allegations that... Yeah, so, so we're always happy to take questions to our Office of Public Affairs. Um, if you give me your card, I'll be happy to pass it along. Okay, thank you. Nearly a year later, in 2019, the Office of the Inspector General released a summary of the investigation launched after Chip's filing of harassment. It found that Judy had lacked candor during her interviews regarding her relationship with Chip. She'd also engaged in a separate, inappropriate sexual relationship with a BOP union executive that included the use of a BOP-issued cell phone to take and send sexually explicit photographs. Judy was subsequently fired, but a long-standing culture of tolerance for sexual harassment at the BOP remained. When you see people abusing the inmates or you read things in the paper about officers having relations with this inmate or that inmate, people are reticent to speak out in public unless they can get some protection because of retaliation. It could end your career, you may not go anywhere. I mean, there is an unspoken rule in the agency. You mess up and you move up because you want to get them out of your department so I'll send them to somebody else. We're really in a crisis situation in the agency with staffing and monetary issues and I think we've gotten away from the core principles of why the agency was established and to begin with and what we're supposed to be doing. Three years later, the BOP's director resigned amid widespread misconduct and Colette S. Peters was named the new director. Do you acknowledge that, you know, there has been huge widespread issues of abuse, of misconduct across the BOP? Yes. Is there something about staff at the BOP? Is there something about the system in which it operates that has allowed this kind of behavior? What we found is that individuals were inside of a culture where 
they were expected to keep the machine running, not share their problems with their chain of command. I have said again and again, gone are the days when we protect people or institutions. When you engage in that type of behavior, you will be fettered out and you will be held accountable. I would love to see a culture where every single person in our care and custody felt safe and better work environments for those people that work for us and better living environments for those that are in our care and custody. That seems like a very idealistic portrait that you've just painted. I mean, what is at stake here if the prison system is not changed? I think we're in a unique moment in time with a new director. I feel like Congress is giving us another chance. Members of the media are giving us another chance to really prove ourselves. We don't have the option to fail. So from as far back as 2017, we have been actually following a program called Young Men Incorporated. This program gave the prisoners power to run the program. Is there any program like that at the moment in the federal prison system? Not that I know of um, anything that's similar to that, but I do know that in my experience, those programs that are peer supported are more likely to be successful. The research will show you individuals who have a shared life experience often are some of the most effective individuals at helping others change. You know, I feel like there's a lot of people who will just think, you know, lock them up, throw away the keys, let's right. not think about it, right? Right. We have engaged in over-incarceration in this country to the degree that it knows no boundaries, no socioeconomic boundaries, no cultural boundaries. It costs over $100,000 to re-incarcerate someone and another victim's been created. So if you are an individual that's listening that thinks we should lock them up and throw away the key, then what about that next victim? We have to do better in corrections, and I think we can. Five years after Taleb received parole, many YMI members have re-entered society including one man we never expected to see on the outside. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, good to see you. Wow. Good to see you, Kevin. It's been a while. Yes, it And I didn't know if I'd see you out in the, in the real world. I didn't expect to ever be out. Kevin got a second chance after the First Step Act made those convicted for crack cocaine sales eligible for a retroactive sentence reduction. Hey! Hi. Good to see you. How are you doing? Great. Chip's company, Reentry Consultant Services, is running a form of YMI for the community out of this Baltimore office. What's been going on? What's, uh, what's new in your life? Our work has transferred to the streets, and this is what this office is about. So you mean you're going out into the streets, you're finding gang leaders in the streets, and you're getting them involved in yes. your program? Are you inside state prisons at the moment? That's the dream is to have the program in the state system and the federal system. So the last time we spoke, the whole situation with Judy had kind of exploded. The program suddenly stopped overnight. I mean, how do you feel about that whole situation? It was very difficult, right, for the program one day to have been, to have had everyone on a high. And when it didn't continue, you know, it just confirmed everybody's fears. It was too good to be true. One thing I would say is that um, I would like to thank Judy um, because at the end of the day, if it wasn't for her, this program wouldn't have never got his legs in coming. You see everybody that's involved doing big things. Look at these men. All of us did a extraordinary length of time, and all of us are out and are successful and giving back in a meaningful way. This is one of the best programs in America in dealing with returning citizens. Just look at the track record. What do you think needs fixing in the BOP? They do not believe in empowering prisoners to run anything. You know, if I could speak with the director, I would say take that chance. You have to be able to find people like Mr. Henry was while he was incarcerated. If you can find these kinds of persons, if you can identify them and put them in a position and have a program that's as comprehensive as YMI is, if you're able to do that, you can change the entire culture of a prison. I don't believe that the, ch that the system changed us. I believe that we changed the system. I would just say, you know, take the risk. The BOP allow a space for me to be the best person who 
I am uh, and who I've always known myself to be, we made the BOP be the best that the BOP could be. Why should society forgive people like you? Society doesn't have to forgive me, but they do have to deal with me because I'm here. Most of these persons are going home someday. These persons who you think you can't trust are gonna be your neighbors. The person who works at Walmart or the person who is driving a Lyft or an Uber. You're gonna meet again. How do you wanna meet again? If you didn't create that program you created right now, if you wouldn't give me that chance, I probably wouldn't be alive, man. Thank you, bro. Thank you. The program fell apart. Will you look into, you know, the potential of reinstating it? Absolutely. We can definitely talk to the team. They can give me a briefing on what the program was about, and we can look at the pros and cons of reinstituting something like that. You're not going to stop him. Just because this program went down, you're not going to stop him. Dominic Henry will find a way to make this program work. I know my purpose is to do everything I can to help them guys. It's my redemption. It's, I think, what I was created. And I'm not going to stop. Mr. Casella serves Dominic Henry. How can I help? You?